All right, Bulldogs, before we dive in here, first off, I want to thank you for watching the routing fundamentals section. I know when you get a brand new training course and you look at the menu and it's got fundamentals on something and then it's got a lot of stuff maybe you haven't even seen before, you really want to jump ahead. I know that because I've been there and on occasion I go back. But these are fundamentals that will help you become a world-class network admin. And with these fundamentals, these are things we really can't give a lot of thought to. We need to know, just know them cold. We need to know these administrative distances. We need to know the basics of how a routing table works because that's something we don't give a lot of thought to and we don't have to because our routing protocols work so well. But when something goes awry, say on an exam question, we better know exactly why the routing table is doing what it does so we can fix it. I've also got some really solid labs here for you I think you'll enjoy. The Stanic Routing Lab is actually from my CCNA lab. I'm doing it here fresh for you, but if you got your NA with me, that's going to look familiar to you. The reason I'm even showing you a Static Routing Lab instead of just a couple of commands is that I want you to see some of this in action when it comes to Static Routing because you'll find out the course is packed with live labs. But this lab will really help you with a little bit of your T-shoot exam too. So it's a little bit of a preview. It's some good stuff there. I'm not just going to type in some static routes. We're going to do some troubleshooting. We're also going to look at floating static routes. And this is a commonly misunderstood topic. It's very straightforward. And the command is only slightly different from that to create a regular static route. But again, I want you to see that live. So we're going to talk about the theory of it. We're going to kind of get the theory out of the way early in this video, 10, 15 minutes maybe, and then dive into some of these labs. But since we're in a lab environment, we can truly test a floating static route. And I'll show you exactly why or how you do it. And uh, off the cuff, we're going to discuss a couple of reasons why you might have to do it. So let's jump right in again. Thanks for watching this part of the video, this part of the course. And let's jump in and talk about how and where distance vector protocols operate to begin with. Typically, and we certainly know this, a distance vector protocol is going to be used at a local area network it, at the LAN level. It's going to be very rare that you see a distance vector protocol run at the wide area network level. And that's because distance vector protocols do have some serious drawbacks. One of them is with RIP version 1, because RIP version 1 broadcasts its routing updates every 30 seconds. Now, RIP version 2 does send them every 30 seconds, but it's a multicast, which is you know, kind of the lesser of two evils here. Both of those protocols are going to send full routing tables as part of their updates, regardless of whether anything has actually changed since the last update. Now, something you'll hear me say often is that everything we do on a Cisco router or everything a Cisco router has to do, there's a cost involved. There is a cost in bandwidth, you know, because it has to be sent across the wire. There's a hit to the CPU. There's a little bit of time because that routing update's got to be packaged. That routing update's got to be sent. Then it's sucking up bandwidth as it goes across the line. Then it's got to be received by downstream routers. And they have to unpack it. They can't just look at a rip pack and say, oh, okay, I know everything in there. They don't know that. They've got to open it and take a look. Then when they see, oh, well, I knew all that stuff I heard that 30 seconds ago, they just discard it. That's a lot of stuff we really don't want going on on a wide area network. There's another issue that you might not have heard about, and that's that our RIP routing updates can hold a maximum of 25 routes. So if you've got 105 routes in your network, you would actually need five separate update packets. We don't just have one giant packet going out. Let's say you had 45 routes, you'd still be sending two. Again, since these updates go out every 30 seconds, I mean, if you've got a change in your network twice a minute that needs to be advertised, you have bigger problems than the routing protocol you're using, believe me. It's just not an effective way of handling things. So RIP, generally, it's a poor choice for a WAN. RIP version 1 in particular, because RIP version 1 is a classful routing protocol, it doesn't even support VLSM. The RIP version 1 updates do not carry subnet mask information. The only masks that RIP version 1 even understands are those three classful masks for A, B, and C. Now even if all that was okay, which it's not, here's a big reason that you don't see distance vector protocols on WANs very often. Because the algorithm that RIP uses, the Bellman Ford algorithm, only considers hop count in computing its metric. That's it. 
So in this particular diagram, there are two paths from A to B. One is a couple of T1 lines, one's a couple of 56K lines. We can pretty much guess which one is the fastest one here, right? But the problem is RIP is going to look at these and consider them equal. And RIP will then perform equal cost load balancing over those links. And again, in today's delay-sensitive, traffic-filled world, voice traffic, video traffic, uh, that's not really something we want to be doing over our wide area network. Now here are some default distance vector protocol behaviors, all of which you should have seen in your NA, but let's just make sure. Split horizon for distance vector protocols, and the reason I'm putting emphasis on that is that it's going to mean something a little bit different to another protocol we talk about later in the course. But for distance vector protocols, split horizon simply means that a routing protocol can't learn about a route on a given interface and then advertise that same route out that same interface. And in this particular diagram, Router 3 is learning about a network on its Ethernet 0 interface, therefore it can't advertise it back out that interface. Poison Reverse, those of you who got your NA with me are saying thank goodness for this because we saw that RIP just has a really hard time converging. When there is a change in the network, depending on your topology, of course, you can have a real problem with RIP finally catching up with itself, if you will. It kind of chases its own tail for a while. And when we do have an unreachable network, that can be a major problem because as we saw in a lab in the, in the NA course, you can have a router sending packets for a long time to a network that literally is unreachable. So Poison Reverse allows a router to advertise a network immediately with a metric of unreachable when that network does indeed become unavailable. And this allows the other routers to learn that that network is unreachable much faster, much, much, much faster than if it were left up to the normal distance vector protocol behaviors. Just some basics here, RIP version 1, version 2, and EIGRP. Of course, we have plenty of EIGRP material to come in the course. RIP version 1, it's going to broadcast those updates every 30 seconds. It's classful, doesn't recognize VLSM. Updates carry the entire routing table. Both versions 1 and 2 use Bellman Ford. RIP version 2 multicasts its updates, however. Both of them will perform equal cost load sharing by default and that max hop count is 15, 16 is considered unreachable. There is no routing update authentication available for version 1. Version 2 does enable you to create an authentication scheme for the routing updates themselves and we can do that in clear text or MD5 so you already know what I'm going to say there. If you're going to the trouble of configuring RIP authentication please go ahead and use MD5. EIGRP, as I mentioned, a lot more to come about that, much more, but just a couple of basics here. It multicasts out to 224.0010. We have adjacencies with EIGRP that we don't have with RIP. Neighbors need to become, well, just that neighbors. Neighboring routers need to become adjacent to each other through a process we'll talk about later before they even exchange updates. EIGRP will send an entire routing table only when that adjacency is first formed because we need one then. But after that it will send only a routing update when necessary, when there's actually change in the network topology and the update reflects only the changes. EIGRP uses the dual routing algorithm. It performs equal cost load sharing by default and as we'll see we can configure unequal cost load sharing with the variance command. We'll be doing that live as well. Now administrative distance, remember this, this is one of those things where when you're memorizing it, and let's face it, we had to memorize these for the NA, you're doing it and you're memorizing and you're thinking, is this really important? You know, and I'm telling you that it is, and it's going to come into play a little bit here, big time I would say in your troubleshooting exam. Now when a route lookup is performed in a routing table, it's not like an access list. Remember access list runs top to bottom and as soon as a match is found, you know, that's the end of the process. Well, that's not the deal with the routing lookup. Basically, there's a four-step process a router goes through when it looks for the best route because we can have more than one route in a routing table for a given destination and actually we like it that way, more than one path, because that gives us some redundancy. If there are multiple routes to a destination, the route with the longest prefix length is used. If there are multiple routes to a destination and they have the exact same prefix length, 
the route with the lowest AD or administrative distance is used. The administrative distance is a measure of a routing source's believability. Third, if there are multiple routes with the same prefix length and the same AD, then the route with the lowest metric is used. And then finally, if there's a tie with all of those prefix length, AD, and metric, all of those routes will be used in load balancing as allowed by the protocol. Now let's take an, a look at this, and it's a um, thankfully no longer a real world example, and it may sound unusual coming from me, but I'll tell you why in just a moment. Let's look at these two routes first that uh, we're looking for the next top destination, 222.131. In the incredibly unlikely but possible circumstance that the router has one path that's been discovered by OSPF and another by IGRP, the two paths could look like that and you see a slash 25 and a slash 24. Now in that case, the OSPF route would thankfully be chosen because it is the longest match. It's got a mask of 25, IGRPs has a mask of 24. But what if the masks were the exact same length? Well, we would need a tiebreaker here and that's where the AD comes in because the path discovered by the protocol with the lowest administrative distance will be used. Now since IGRP's administrative distance is 100 and OSPF's is 110, the IGRP path would actually be used over the OSPF path. Now some of you are listening is thinking, what's IGRP? I've never heard of this. What is this? Why is this in here? <clears throat> well, you have kind of heard of it, even if you haven't heard of it. This is the original version, really, of EIGRP. EIGRP, that E stands for enhanced. This is the original version of the protocol. Now I left it here, and I'm going to mention this in the book as well, I left it here strictly to show you first off why we don't miss IGRP, because the IGRP protocol was dumb as a sack of rocks. Okay, it's right there with RIP version 1. Not a sophisticated protocol. But the problem is that at one point it was, you know, certainly a good protocol. Everything's good when it's first designed except for Vista. And you know, it was okay, so the administrative distance was set to 100. The problem is, is that and then much more sophisticated protocols came along like OSPF, but OSPF had an AD of 110. So that's why I said thankfully here, because again, IGRP's metric, not particularly uh, complex. And I, I would be surprised if you can see IGRP mentioned on the exam. I'm going to mention it maybe once or twice more in the EIGRP section we'll do a little comparing and talk about why we needed an enhanced version but just take my word for it right now if you never worked with it you didn't really miss anything it configured pretty much just like RIP it really did and this was kind of a classic practice exam question I wouldn't know if they had it on the real one but it's like oh if you've got an OSPF path and an IGRP path if the prefix length is the same IGRP is going to win because it has a lower administrative distance so again you won't really be hearing or seeing from IGRP much. Actually, it's no longer supported by the Cisco IOS, and it's no longer supposed to be on any of the exams. It's definitely not going to be on your NP route exam as far as configuring it, but I think a little bit of knowledge here and there about it is not a bad thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now on the screen, you see some good AD values to know. Notice I said EIGRP summary 5 if you know where to look. Uh, for a long time, we were just taking that as a leap of faith because people would say, well, I configured a summary route and, you know, I see an AD of 90 or I see an AD of 170. I don't ever see a 5. I will show you where that 5 is in this course. There are also mentioning that there are two kinds of EIGRP routes, and we're definitely going to be seeing both of those in the EIGRP section. The internal routes, those are the ones that you'll learn about in your CCNA studies where you just put the network command, you know, 110.0.0.0, whatever it is, and then it has the D next to it. Remember, D stands for EIGRP, because by the time we came up with EIGRP, something else already had the letter E. Well, when you have EIGRP learn a route via route redistribution, then it's an external route, and that's got an AD of 170. You may have seen that number in your NA studies. We don't do a lot of route redistribution in the NA we have plenty of it in this course and you'll be seeing those numbers so just watch those on exam day again your internal or native EIGRP routes have an AD of 90 your external routes have an AD of 170 
So again, all good numbers to know. And they really come into play in our route table operation. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about on the very next video. See you there.